their doctrine, and he's trying to build them up in doctrine. Uh, first, I am an apostle, because they were saying Paul's not an apostle. He's an apostle. We know he's an apostle. God chose him. Then the big thing was, Paul, you don't have the true gospel, because the true gospel needs the works of the law and the circumcision. He said, no, the true gospel is by God's grace alone, through your faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, that's the true gospel. That's all there is to the gospel of salvation. The gospel, it's a gospel of grace. It's God's grace. It comes through your faith. If you believe what God said, God will give you grace and give you new life. And then they said, okay, well, if that is a true gospel, the problem with your gospel is your gospel is so easy and so simple, it'll lead people just to live any way they want and be a bunch of sinners. He said, well, not exactly. You don't quite understand. God's grace has a purpose in mind. And we saw in the last chapter that the purpose, one of the great purposes, it's a birth of the Spirit, and therefore we live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And we saw last week how uh, there is a great difference between the Spirit and the flesh. The flesh lusts after all kinds of crazy things that were mentioned in that fifth chapter there, uh, lasciviousness and, and adultery and uh, fornication and, uh, gosh, there's just so many things listed there. I think there's 17, 18 things listed, idolatry, witchcraft, wrath, strife. That's the flesh, envy, murder, all those things this flesh does. But the spirit, the, the gospel of grace brings a new birth inside the spirit that begins to change people and they don't want to live that old way. They now have love, they have joy, they have peace, they have long suffering, they have gentleness, they have goodness, they have faith, they have meekness, they have temperance. They're, they're now Christ's, they're living in the spirit, they're walking in the spirit. It, it really does bring a change. The true gospel brings a change. Uh, I remember a doctor one day, I was witnessing back at a sister's hospital, and uh, he was at the scrub sink scrubbing up and the assistant was scrubbing up and we had been talking for a while on the break and he said, but I don't get it. He said, you're telling me you just get saved and that's it and you can go out and do anything you want. And I said, well, you don't quite get it. I said, it is true I can go out and do anything I want, but the Lord changes your taste buds. You don't want to do things you used to want to do. It's new. You're a new creature. Change has come. Uh, I don't want to do those things mentioned in that uh, few verses there anymore. I, I now want to learn to have gentleness. I, I, I desire temperance. I desire love and joy and peace. These are the things I desire. And, and there's a change. I mean, yes, it saved me from the penalty of sin. That's true. But now give me a new power over sin and a new taste bud to go a different way. So you know, we, we have to remind people of this. Yes, it's simple to get saved, but then once you're saved, God does a great work, and it's God's work. Amen. Now, in the sixth chapter, he wants to, uh, if you wanted to title the first ten verses, it's the law of Christ. And uh, we'll read them, and then we'll comment on them. And he says, brethren, Galatians 6, verse 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye, which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man uh, think himself to be something, when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have, uh, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. The contrasts that Paul makes, he makes these contrasts, is the difference between liberty or bondage, the difference between the spirit or the flesh. The contrast in the law of Christ is that the law of Christ makes you think of others, not self. 
That's the first principle of the law of Christ. At least the first one mentioned in this chapter. Maybe the second principle. But it's the first one he's mentioning in this chapter. You see, the flesh is me first. The spirit is, what about these others around me? You think of others, not self. You can't spell the word uh, uh, brothers without the word others in there. And so, so it's brethren, it's brothers. We are brothers in Christ. So we think of the other, not self. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, who cares? I'm doing just fine. No, but if a man be overtaken in a fault, this is where we think of the others and not just self. If a man be overtaken in a fault, now notice, he, he didn't say a sin. He said a fault. And if you go through the scriptures, I think the word is 19 times in the Bible. Uh, uh, the first time it's ever mentioned is Genesis 41, verse 9. And there was an incident with a man who worked for the Pharaoh. And he said to the Pharaoh, you know, I remember my faults this day. A fault is from the word follow. It's a, a failing. It's a, a blunder. It's like a mistake. It's, in the case of the Pharaoh, it's like a neglect of duty. Whether it's due to inattention or sometimes due to design, usually due to inattention. Faults are, they're horizontal, they're interpersonal, they're between people. Sins are vertical, they're between God. Now it is true, you can commit a sin that also affects another person. But the faults are interpersonal. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in his there's only a few times in the times that he taught in all four Gospels. As a matter of fact, it's only twice when the Lord Jesus Christ ever mentioned the word church. And in one of the times he mentioned the word church about something that he'd be building in the future, he talked about it in Matthew 18, and he said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Faults. They're... they're mistakes, blunders, neglect of duties that we make one to another. And then he talks about how this is something that involves the church. And if you neglect to hear, you take it to the church because this is a fault between brethren. Um, Paul addressing in 1 Corinthians 6 with an error, he says, you know, you got brother going to brother uh, before the law, before unbelievers, there's utterly a fault among you. Because you go to law with another. I mean, there are faults between you guys, and you got to take it out there. You can't handle it properly. Faults, these interpersonal problems that come up. Uh, later on, he would tell the uh, uh, Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians, I just want to get these things, and I want to show you why it's important to understand the difference between faults and sins. Yeah. We're not out there correcting other people's sins. That is the work of God. The Holy Ghost convicts of sin. We don't. We're not the Holy Ghost. Your heart's not right with God. Yeah. No. God will determine whose heart is right and not right. And the Holy Ghost will convict. All you can do is put guilt on people. Instead of being a burden bearer, you'll be a burden later. And you'll laden burdens on people. And God doesn't want that. The Pharisees did that. And so God's trying to teach the difference. God convicts of sin. We get faults from one another. Okay, we, we try and work them out. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And just reading some verses, I want to get these things uh, in your mind. Uh, Paul says, um, chapter 2 actually. Uh, and I'm just reading these things, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, Sufficient to such a man is a punishment which was inflicted of many. Uh, contrary wise, forgive this man, comfort this man. This man had committed a sin against God, but it was a fault against someone in the church simultaneously. And he says, now it's time that you have, it's time that you've given him his uh, punishment by putting him out of the church. Now it's time to restore him. You want to forgive this person. The man had a fault and now you're in the process of dealing with it and you're in the process of restoring him. And this was an example of what was talking about here. Later on, the reason I bring this up is because there's a passage in the Bible that is mistranslated in modern Bibles. But it's not mistranslated in God's Bible. And in God's Bible, James chapter 5, verse 16, says, Confess your faults one to another. 
but not your sins. We're not to confess our sins one to another. Our sins are to be confessed only to God. Only God needs to know about your sin problems. Once we start looking one another on sin, we're going to get into a mess. We're going to start thinking we're better than someone else. There's one point where, where God says into the book of Isaiah, he's so angry with them. He says, behind the doors and the posts, thou hast set up thy remembrance and thou hast discovered thyself to another man. Talking about people confessing sins one to another. And God says, I don't like that. I don't like someone getting in a booth and confessing sins one to another. Nobody needs to know your sin. You get in a closet, you confess your sins to me. But if you've done something to a brother, and you've hurt a brother, and there's been a fault, even was by accident, neglect, you didn't mean to do it, but it happened and he's hurt, well, then you confess, hey, brother, it was my fault. It was my fault. It wasn't yours. I didn't mean to do that. And faults are meant to be dealt with. Faults are meant to be dealt with. Biblical faults. Not biblical gnats. Uh, back to where we are in Galatians. And, and our job isn't to be fault-finding. You can, it's your glory to pass over a transgression. Psh, don't bother me, you didn't mean it probably. It all depends on your heart and when you're intending to that man's heart. But if you have a man that ever is in a fault, then at that point, he needs restoration. Now, the how to restore. Well, he's telling us, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. And the qualifications to restore is you must be spiritual. You must be spiritual. Now, Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, you know, the problem with you guys, you're carnal. You're not spiritual. And I can absolutely assure you, a carnal brother can't help anyone overcome a fault. Because he's just a faulty machine himself. And he's got his own problems. So, so babes in Christ cannot fulfill Galatians 6. Galatians 6 follows Galatians 5, talking about being full of the Spirit. Having the love and the joy and the peace and the long-suffering and the gentleness and the goodness and the meekness and the temperance that will allow you to overcome a fault. Otherwise, if you don't have the spirit of meekness, you're going to be tempted also. Here's the problem. you got someone overtaken in a fault. What are the, some of the things that the Lord would have someone who's received his gospel to do? Someone who's received the gospel of Jesus Christ has commanded, has a newborn babe, to desire the sincere milk of the word and grow, 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 grow thereby. He need the, the sincere milk milk of the word. So, so a good new Christian should be learning to partake of the word of God. He does it personally in Bible reading. He does it corporately at the church. A new Christian is learning to pray to his heavenly father. And someone is having a faulty part of their Christianity and they're not reading their Bible and it's affecting their walk with their members of the church or other brothers and sisters. They're not praying and you're seeing that and you want to help them and say, look, let me help you with this thing. I want to help you to get on a Bible reading plan. I want to help you in your church attendance and participation so you can begin to grow. But the, I have to be very meek when I do it and I have to consider lest I be tempted. Here's how my temptation is. God's very gracious. There are Christians with all kinds of faults in their walk. And you go, you think, well, gee, that, that's a faulty walk and I want to help it. But then I notice he's been doing this for months and getting away with it. I'll bet I can get away with it too. And I get tempted and thinking, you know, before you know it, I'm not reading my Bible. I'm not praying. I'm not attending church because he's not doing it. It's not affecting him at all. And you get tempted and you fall into the same type of thing. That, that's what happens. Do you understand what happens? God would like Christians to get on the straight and narrow way and begin walking toward after the Lord and a whole bunch fall by the wayside and sit down and take a chance and they, they take a nap and they get on a park bench and they backslide and at first we start watching them and we say you shouldn't be, come on, we got to get back, we got to get back and then we notice nothing's happening to them. God's still letting them go on and he does. He's very gracious and then you start doing the same thing. And you get tempted into the same type of backslidden, easy condition. You have to be careful about these things. 
You need a spirit of meekness. You need to be spiritual. And when you're helping the person, verse 2, you are bearing one another burdens. And you're fulfilling the law of Christ. Christ's law is to look on the others and to help when they're struggling. We're shepherds in the flock and there are sickly sheep and there are uh, broken sheep and there are hurting sheep. And our job is we're trying to help them along. This is the law of Christ. We're burden bearers. We're not burden loaders like the Pharisees. The law of Christ in Romans 8, 2 is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of Christ is only fulfilled by the Spirit, which is why he waited for this chapter till he finished the last chapter. It's a growing process. We need to grow in the Spirit. And the law of Christ, the first order is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the law of love. This is the law of Christ. Loving our brothers, not just loving ourselves. The Lord Jesus told the men in the upper room, This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. See, and he's going to show us later as he concludes this in verse 10, especially the household of faith. God so loved the world. Yes, he did. But he loved his church more. And he loves his church more. And he loves his children more than he loves unbelievers. He loved unbelievers enough to die for them. But once he gets his children, there's a difference. Now, if you're parents, you know the difference. There's a difference to how you love your children and how you love one of the neighbor's children. There is a difference. And the law of Christ is the law of love, particularly in the brethren. Loving the brethren. The law of the spirit of life in Christ, the love of God working in the brethren, trying to restore those that are fallen, who call to do it. Spiritual ones, how do you do it? Meekness. You see, this is what he's showing you, uh, verse 3 and 4. If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. Now here, what he's showing you. Going back to connecting verses, particularly 2 and 3 with 1, there's the word in verse 1, restore. The process of restoration is verse 2. Restoration is, is bearing burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. Verse 3 is also connected to verse 1, but it's the how. See, if you think when you see a brother fallen, and you think in your own mind, hey, I'm something, I can handle it. Or it says, no, no, you're nothing. You can't handle it. You can't handle that guy's problem. You're not capable. Verse 3 connects to verse 1. Uh, verse 2 connects to the word restore in verse 1. Verse 3 connects to the phrase, the spirit of meekness in verse 1. The only way that you can handle a fallen brother is when you meekly acknowledge the fact that you can't handle the problem the brother has. When you're spiritual enough to realize, I can't fix that problem. God can bring me alongside and through lots of prayer, and we're going to see later on the ministry of the word, which is why he talks about, let him that is taught in the word, because we're going to use the word to teach that person that's struggling. That's the only way we're going to fix him in a spirit of meekness. Your spirit can't correct their spirit. Your rebukes aren't going to convict them. Your kicks in the butt aren't going to get them back on their feet. And if you think you're something, you're wrong. But if you take the word of God in a spirit of meekness and apply the word of God through exhortation, through edification, through comfort, then the spirit of Christ can work in that person's heart and life. And any fruit that will be born and that person's life will be the work of God working in them, not you. Understand? Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't, I'm afraid some of our best doctors out there don't. Go ahead. Can I just add some wisdom about the whole fall thing? Go ahead. I'd be tempted. A fall is like a crack, it's a division between two things that are supposed to be united. 
Again, and again, it, the problem is our spirit. When we think we're something, when we think we're the solution. I mean, I, I don't... Uh, when, here, here. He's talking about this thing, okay? He's saying, okay, we're, we're in an attempt. And in our attempt, we understand uh, we're supposed to be in a restoration ministry because that's the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is a ministry of restoration and thinking of others, not self. And the law of Christ is is bearing one another burdens. Not just my own burdens, but I'm bearing someone else's burden. Now, here's the beautiful thing that we all understand. Say, look, i got enough problems on my own. I can't can't carry that guy's problem. But here's the beautiful thing. We have a burden bearer. Part of the ministry of reconciliation and the ministry of restoration is I'm helping you to carry this burden along with mine and give it to the Lord. I'm temporarily just helping you move a burden onto the Lord. I'm not bearing that burden. I'm helping you bear it to the Lord. I'm teaching the person how to bring his problem to the Lord. I'm helping him bring it to the Lord. And then the burden is off both of us. God doesn't want us burdened that way. He wants us to learn to bring our burdens and cast them upon him, for he careth for us. And this is part of the growing process. So so we see verse 2 connects to the word restore. Verse 3 connects to the spirit of meekness. And then, and then I would have written verse 4, So let every man prove his own work. But, he, but he, then he said, but. And I said, why do you put but? And then I understood why. Because here's... My restoration ministry is not to get this guy to live, walk, think, and behave and be convicted as I am, where his work now looks like mine, where I'm now comfortable because he's behaving the way I behave and he thinks the way I think. No. But let every man prove his own work. I have my own work to prove before God, and that restored guy going to have his own work to prove before God, and it's going to be different than mine. This, this, this happened to me. I learned this practically in life, and then I learned this in the church. Practically in life, I was an anesthesiologist. We would work in hospitals with many ORs. I worked in a hospital, we had 10 ORs. And, and I would get my assignment, Mike, you're in room two today. And I'd go to room two, and I'd set up room two, and I'd start working in room two. And my work was to do room two. That was my job. I had a brother anesthesiologist in room one. That was his job. I had a brother in room three. That was his job. I'm calling them brothers because we're in the trade of anesthesiology. Think of Christians. We all had our work to do. Now, every so often, once in a while, a nurse would come running down the hall screaming, there's a problem in room one. They need help in room one. They can't, they can't intubate. They can't get the tube out of the esophagus into the duodenum. I mean, all kinds of things. And, and, and then one of us would run over to help restore that work. And once that thing was restored, you know what I did? I didn't hang around to see how he did the rest of the job and prove his work. I went back to my room and did what I was doing. Because now it's, be, now it's his. And, 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 and you've got to understand this thing. Once you help restore a guy, he's back on the road with Christ. You don't need to hover over him like some hen. And watch over him. Make sure he's got the right convictions that you have. He's got his work. You've got your work. He's his man. You're man. You're your own man. You're going to prove your own one day. You're going to be proven his. See, the problem is when you think yourself to be something, you're getting conceited. And the Bible uses the word conceit a lot. And sadly, conceit is a work of the flesh that gets into the church. And, and uh, to conceit, that's con capeo, that's to seize, to, to, to seize or take a self-flattering opinion, a vain conception of your own person or accomplishment. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Instead, we we need to be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. Condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. 
And if any man thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. This, this I had to learn. When I was young, when I was young, first going to these churches and watching, and watching pastors trying to whip things out of people, and then I thought, that, that, that's not going to work. Because I know what God did in my life. And it wasn't what people did, it was what God did. And then the witness of men only goes so far, but the witness of God is greater. And then my determination was, look, let the Spirit of God make the witness of God in their life. And the only thing I can do is use the Word of God, which is why this passage will talk about sowing seed, which is the Word of God. Because there's no better way to help someone than the Word of God. Like he said before, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? How did you get the Spirit? Didn't you get it by the hearing of faith? Then how are you going to grow in the Spirit? Won't it be by the hearing of faith? Is there some other way? Is there some worldly wisdom I'm going to come up with or some philosophy to move someone in the right direction? See, the, the, the problem is, verse 3, when you think you're something, you, you're self-deceiving. You've deceived yourself when you think you're something. I like that verse. I once used it for Bible math. When a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing. You're a big fat zero, but that's okay. Christ is the one. So if you get Christ in front of you, one plus zero makes ten. Big multiplication factor. Get another zero following, I got a hundred. Get another guy, I got a thousand. You see how this thing grows? Yeah. But if I get the zeros in front and put the one at the end, I got point zero 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 one. I got no effect. Yeah. You're putting the word of God and God up front and you really got a multiplication thing going here and getting all the zeros in line. This thing could get as big as Google. That's, that's, that's 10 to the 100. That's what a church could be, a, a Google. A 10 of, so, so look, at, rather than self-deception, he says, but let every man prove his own work. How about some self-examination? Before I go to help somebody, why don't I examine myself first? Why don't I uh, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith? Prove your own selves. Okay, I'm saved. Uh, Jeremiah wrote in the book of Lamentations, let us search, let us try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Before I get involved in this restoration process, why don't I do some searching? Why don't I do some praying? Why don't I turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I got an issue here. It's the first thing I do. When someone's got trouble, first thing I do is take it to the Lord. Lord, we got a problem here. I mean, it, 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 something needs to be done. Please help. And I take it to the Lord. I want the Lord to begin working. Then I start searching the scriptures. Is there something I can do that will be a blessing? Is there some way I can bless that person with the word of God to help them get restored? Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. When you're going through the scriptures, you say, this will be a help, this will be a help, this will be a help. Not this will beat them over the head. This will be a help. Hold fast to the things that are good. We're trying to restore people and help people. We're not trying to shoot our wounded. We're trying to bandage them up. Prove what is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. How are you going to do it? Well, verse 6, let him that is taught in the word. We're going to use the word. We're going to renew our mind to make sure we have the word, to minister the word. There's no better healing balm than the balm of Gilead, which is the word of God. The law of Christ involves the word of Christ. And what happens, verse 4, let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Our rejoicing is personal between us and the Lord. Now we rejoice when someone gets right, but ultimately one day that man will stand before the Lord. The desire accomplishes sweet to the soul. When you desire to fulfill the law of Christ and help someone, you will be blessed in your soul. And you'll rejoice. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. A good man shall be satisfied from himself. You want your satisfaction, it's going to come from you doing the law of Christ. And accomplishing a desire that's deep in your soul that the Lord's giving you. This is where spirituality comes in. Verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now the critic jumps right away on this verse. 
Critics jump on this verse. I've had a kind of college tell me, see the difference? Verse 5 and verse 2. A verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. Verse 5, every man shall bear his own burden. See, the Bible contradicts itself. I said, well, wait a second. Let's look at the tense. The tense is different. Verse 2 is present tense. Right now, while we're down here in these mortal bodies, bear ye one another burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ down here, the law of love, the law of restoration, while we're still walking in this mortal body, which Paul said is wrestling spirit against the flesh. While we're down here in the present tense, we're bearing. But verse 5 is the future. For every man shall bear his own burden. There is a day coming when you and I will be at the judgment seat of Christ. And then it's going to be you alone. And it's going to be him alone. Every man alone, like a turnstile, one on one with the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. The father shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. It's alone. God made souls alone. God judges souls alone. One day you'll bear your burdens alone. I won't be able to help you. So that's why you start growing grace in your spirit now. So when you stand before the Lord, you'll stand there as spiritual and you'll hear, well done. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, you don't want to listen to what God says, thou alone shall bear it. One day you will bear it. Romans 14, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. There is a judgment seat of Christ. And every Christian, for his own personal walk, and his own personal conduct, and his own personal responsibility, that's the principle he's trying to teach you. There's personal responsibility. And one of our personal responsibilities he's trying to teach us in the passage is the love and the care of our close brethren. And maybe one day that'll be one of the burdens we'll bear before the Lord to say, look, I put that broken brother right in front of you and you walked right on past and did nothing to help. And I gave you opportunity. And there were some passages you read in the Psalms and in Proverbs that would have blessed him and some things from the upper room discourse that would have blessed him and you ignored it. He's putting us to work together. This is the law of Christ. Burden bearing, restoration, the law of love. How do we do it? Verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. What are we going to do? We're going to teach him in the word. There's no better way to help someone who's struggling. What would make someone struggle? Wrong thoughts. Wrong ideas. Wrong precepts. Wrong principles. Wrong teaching. Most people do things wrongly because they're taught wrong or they've never been taught and they're thinking on their own. What's the only thing that can correct wrong thinking? The Word of God. So we take the Word of God to communicate to them. And then if you've been taught, you communicate back to him that teacheth in all good things. Now, the word communicates only four times in the Bible. It's all in the New Testament. Timothy says, they that do good, that they be rich in word, good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. We're talking about uh, sharing and giving of earthly things, gold and silver and money and stuff like that. Uh, if the Gentiles have been made partaker of the Jews' spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to the Jews in carnal things. And you're giving something back. And what he's saying is, when, when I know this when I was a young Christian. When someone blessed me spiritually... I couldn't bless them back spiritually. I had no spiritual currency to give, but I had money currency. And, and, the, and the men that helped me early on in my life, I, I didn't know what to do except buy things for them and give them cards with dollars in them and, and denominations. You know, I mean, th that's what I did. I mean, I felt so, how can I bless this guy? He just blessed me. I certainly can't bless him spiritually. I got nothing to give him. He, and I could understand he was giving down to me. There was no way I could make my water run uphill. But I had some money I could give, and I'd give a card with a thank you note and a gift card and some money or whatever. It's a natural response, and God says it's a perfectly fine response. That's why he says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him the teacher that taught. Teach, give him something good. And I know that's a natural outflowing of the heart. I know we, we do that naturally, but God just confirms it in writing it. 
Verse 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's probably been preached more than I Love Lucy reruns. I mean, <laughs> that verse has been... And look, it's a good principle. Now, now it's a, there are four verses, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And the 7 is the why, and the 8 is the what, and the 9 is the when, and the 10 is the how. And it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a bunch of teaching in here. But, but it's a good launching springboard verse for us to understood, uh, be not deceived, God is not mocked. The first thing he wants you to understand is be not deceived. The greatest problem in the world, they said, what's going to happen in the last days? Deception. Many will say I'm Christ. Deception. People are deceived. First thing I want you to understand, be not deceived. You may be, but God isn't. I mean, we, we get deceived. I get deceived. I've been deceived. Probably everyone in this audience has been deceived. Maybe along the life, you can think in your own life, it's somewhere where someone deceived you out of money. Some bad deal, some bad sale, some something. What happened? You were deceived. Had you known the truth, you never would have made the purchase. Okay, but that's just carnal. The greater deception is spiritual. And, and God wants you to understand, he's not deceived. We get deceived. And here's the problem in the deception. We think, see, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Our life is, is a life of sowing and reaping, of doing. And every action has a reaction to it. That's a fundamental law of physics that Newton discovered. Every force has an opposing force. Every action has a reaction to it. And it's just like that spiritually. And when we're out there, we're doing things, and whatever we sow, that's what we reap. So if you want to sow from the flesh, you want to sow emulations, you want to sow wrath, you're an angry man. You know what you're going to reap? You're going to reap anger. You, you want to sow sedition and uprising. Every, everywhere you are, you want to show how your boss doesn't know what he's doing. Your teacher doesn't know what they're teaching. That policeman doesn't know what he's doing. You want to sow uprising. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get a whole bunch of people that don't trust you either. That's what happens. That's, what, that's a devil's problem. He's got a divided kingdom. You think everyone follows him in line? He's taught them to be rebels. They're all rebels. They want to rebel against him. Everybody wants to be their own God that's in his army. Because that's what he taught. You want to sow that way, anything you sow, you're going to reap. You want to sow infidelity, you're going to get infidelity. You want to sow to your flesh. You want to spend time reading lascivious novels. You're going to have a dirty mind. You want to spend time on that computer looking at dirty pictures. You're going to have a polluted mind and a polluted lifestyle. When you sow these things, they're going to come back. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Why? He set the laws that way. God set the law. That's why you want to sow to the Spirit. I don't have any friends. Are you friendly? If you sow in a friendly manner, when we went to medical school, I didn't have any of these principles before me. I was a lost man. So... So uh, I, I confess my ignorance and my faults and my sin. One, I was selfish. I went to medical school for Mike and Mike alone. But we had one guy there. He was a Jewish boy from New York, and I guess he was raised with the Bible. And that guy just sowed niceness to everybody. He didn't always think about himself. He thought about other people. He was really nice. He was one of the nicest guys at our college. And you know what? He had lots of friends everywhere. The student body loved him. The older students loved him. The teachers loved him. Why? That's, he just showed himself friendly to everybody. He always put other people's needs. Hey, you, you need a, a Pepsi? Let me get you one. He was doing things for people. I, wouldn't, I was thinking about me and only me. I got to get to my next class. I wouldn't think. He was thinking of other people. And he showed that and he, he won back big time. Great respect for four years. That's what happens. This is a law that God put in place. You show yourself friendly, you'll have friends. You sow love, you'll have people love you. you you're a peacemaker, you won't have enemies. 
You'll have some enemies so far on the outside, of course, you'll, but not the ones around you. Your friends will accumulate. Just the opposite of the world where enemies accumulate. These are laws that God put in place. And if you sow to the Spirit, he'll tell you. Verse 8, if you sow to the flesh, of the flesh you'll reap corruption. That's all the flesh can do. It's corruptible. Ever since Adam sinned in the garden, we got a corruptible body. It gets messy. It gets older, it smells more. And more funny things come out of it. And anything you sow to it that's fleshy, more of that stuff is going to come out. You ever see a rank sinner that lives a life in sin and they're just overwhelmed with all kinds of issues? And then you see someone that's sowing to the Spirit and righteousness and they actually have a glow and a health about them. They eat right, they live right, they read right, they love right. There is a difference. And when you sow to the flesh, you're going to, of the flesh, reap corruption. And this is the divide I want the Christian to understand. You're born again. God cannot impute a single sin to your soul. But he will let every sin you commit be imputed to your flesh. That's the only place he can judge you now, is in that body of sin. And he will let it happen. And that's why some of us are weak and sickly. Because we don't live according to the word of God. Now I'm not telling you live according to the word of God, you're going to live forever but you're going to live your healthiest and your best. You've got a line like this you can be living, and every time you start sowing, you're going to be dropping that line down. And God will let you cut your days short, as he says in Ecclesiastes. He won't let you lengthen them. He's got a day when you're supposed to die. But you want to cut it short? God says, be my guest. You want to soak to your flesh? You want to, you want to take drugs? You can die sooner. I don't mind. You want to smoke? You can die sooner. I don't mind. You want to commit uh, sins like fornication in places where it shouldn't be committed? You can die of AIDS. No, I don't mind. Sexually transmitted. I'll let it happen. God will let your sins be punished in your flesh. He won't punish your soul. Don't be deceived. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. He's got laws. And you're not breaking them. But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You see, why do we want to do what we do? Because sowing and reaping is God's law and God's not mocked. What do we do? Well, what we're doing is we're sowing to the Spirit. How do you sow to the Spirit? Well, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth bearing weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Hey, when you go out with that book, the seed is the word of God. When you go out with tracts, when you sow on the street and you talk about Jesus Christ and you stand up for him and you give his word, God's not mocked. You're going to get rewarded. God is going to reward you. Uh, the wicked may work a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Saying, well, righteousness is my lifestyle. Well, yeah, possibly, but according, I got five verses in Psalm 119 that say righteousness is the word of God. I'll give them to you. I'll give you one. Well, Psalm 119, 123. My eyes fail for thy salvation and the word of thy righteousness. Also read same Psalm verses 142, 144, 172. Don't think yourself to be something. The word of God and Jesus is something. So go out and sow that good seed. And I guarantee you, why you do it, it's the law of God. And what you do, you sow that good seed. And sow to yourselves in righteousness, Hosea says. Hosea 10, verse 12. Do a little reading on your own. Do a little praying on your own. Sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. Get back to God. Keep your spirituality strong. Fulfill the law of Christ. Seek him till he come and rain righteousness on you. So we see why we do it. It's God's law, verse 7. We see what we're doing. We're sowing his word. We're sowing his word. His spirit attends to his word. Why is Christianity a mess today? They don't have the word of God. And the spirit with a capital S is not attending to what's going on in those places. It's sad. It breaks my heart. What's attending? Other spirits. Verse 9, when? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. The law of sowing and reaping is fixed. The law of sowing and reaping says what you sow, that's what you get. So why don't you sow the word of God, which has the spirit in it? And the law of sowing and reaping has a when thing. 
You don't get tomorrow what you sowed today. Now, I was never a farmer. But I know enough sense that if I throw a seed in the ground, it's not coming up tomorrow. It takes time. When? In due season. When God says it's time, it'll come. Sometimes you're sowing the word of God to a member of your family or someone and you're not seeing effect, a neighbor, a co-worker, and you're not seeing effect and you're frustrated. You've got to give that seed time to take root. You've got to give that seed then a chance to be watered by God. And it'll come. So don't quit. Don't faint. Any farmer understands that. And the Lord wants us to have the same understanding. It takes time. The law of Christ takes time. Bearing burdens. If, if you've got someone you're working with and I'm sowing to them, I'm sowing and not seem to be getting anywhere. I'm sowing, I'm sowing, I'm not getting anywhere. Have patience. Have long suffering. All those fruits. Have that gentleness. Have that temperance. Have that meekness. Not going to happen overnight. I got a situation I've been working on for years. It hasn't happened yet. I hope it gets, it may not happen until the rapture, but I, I'm not going to quit what I'm doing. I understand. In due season, it's going to come. Guaranteed. It's going to come in. Doubtless, doubtless shall come again with rejoicing, bringing the sheaves. That's God's law. God will not let you be mocked in the day of judgment because he's not going to be mocked. The when is a reality. And the last thing is the how. Verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Look, we love the lost. We, we care for the lost. We sow seed to the lost. But when there's a i got to make a decision now. And there's only one me. There's only one hour ahead of me. i got to make a decision. Then the priority and the principle is the house of faith over the lost. Why? That's the body of Christ. By one spirit, we've been baptized into one body. Brethren. Brethren. First word of the chapter. Brethren. See, see, the law of Christ, in the contrast, it's others, not self. And the others is brothers first. And the law second. So, so these are the choices that have to be made. It's a, the household of faith. How do I help the household of faith? Well, uh, we do what we can to stay close to the Lord and so to ourselves in righteousness and seek His face. And we do the things, we're involved in the things He's doing. We don't forsake the assembling together. This is the household of faith. Yeah, but, but there's a birthday party. Well, the birthday party is a bunch of lies. I might be able to witness them. You, they all know you're saved. You've witnessed to them enough. This is the household of faith. That's the pri priority tonight. Tell them next time don't hold it when we're having church. Uh, my, they call me from my fa family. You know, Well, we're having this thing on Sunday at 11 o'clock. Good, have it. Have a good time. Well, it's the 50th anniversary. Well, have a good time. I'll be there at 1.30. But I got the household of faith. These are my brothers. The ones that hear the, God, the word of God and do it. Uh, I'm not sure where to give this money. I got the United Way. I got the Red Cross. I got St. Jude's. Or, or I got uh, some brethren that are really in need over there in a foreign nation. And they've just been hit by a tsunami and their church was wiped out and needs to be rebuilt. No question. There's no question as to what the priority and the principle is here. How do I do it? Brethren, brethren first. That's the body of Christ. Think of your own body. If your body is wounded and needs to be fixed, you know what they say on those airplanes? When we hit an area and there's low oxygen and that thing drops down, who's the first to take the oxygen? You take your oxygen first before you can help someone else. If your body's dead, it ain't worth anything to anybody. You've got you to gotta heal first before you can help someone else, especially to the household of faith. Yes, burden-bearing is, is the law of Christ. 
And the law of Christ is first brothers. And you don't think of self, you think of others. And you've got to be spiritual. Very spiritual. Don't think you're something. Understand it's only going to be the Lord that can do it. It's only the Lord that can do it. You stay meek. You stay close to the Lord. You give the problem to the Lord. You try and take the person's burden. Bear it over to the Lord. Get them restored. And once they're restored, let them on their way and continue on your path. Remember, I have my own course. You have your own course. A runner fell down, get him up, get him back on his course. Get back in your course. That's good to be saved. I like the law of Christ. It sure beats the law of uh, nature. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us to understand this law, that it's a law of love and it's a law of burden bearing. And thankfully, you are the ultimate burden bearer to whom we can give our burdens. And Lord, we are nothing, but thou art wonderful. Help us, Lord, I pray, to be spiritual and maybe at a point where we won't need restoration because we're staying on our course. Help us, Lord, all to get back on our course. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sure.